what's up, everybody? Isaac here with Civil Engineering Academy. Excited to be with you today. Today, I do an interview with Matt Handel, who runs a website called HelpEverybodyEveryday.com, and it is dedicated to developing proposals. Matt has written proposals uh, for a variety of industries in all 50 states for a variety of different projects, uh, winning multi-million dollar projects and managing those. And he just knows a plethora of knowledge about writing and winning on proposals. So I wanted to bring him on to talk about proposals, mistakes that he sees made. Uh, you should know as an engineer that you are definitely going to get involved with these at some stage in your career. Maybe when you're starting out, you're not thinking about developing proposals. But it will come as you move up the ladder. You'll be asked to work on these. So I interview Matt. I think you're really going to enjoy this. And, um, you know, one of those first steps in actually developing your career is earning your FE and your PE. And if you don't have those yet, you definitely want to get those. Definitely check out our resources at civilengineeringacademy.com uh, to get FE and PE courses. We also have tons of free content on our YouTube channel and, uh, and other things, exams and everything else. So go check it out, civilengineeringacademy.com. Um, but anyway, you're going to enjoy this interview with Matt. Uh, go check out his website, and uh, if you've ever had an interest in, or in learning about proposals or wanting to learn how to uh, win proposals or learn about common mistakes with proposals, you're going to want to check this out, and it was really fun. I really enjoyed it, and I think you will too. It's coming up right after this. All right, Matt. Welcome to the Civil Engineering Academy podcast. Thanks for being here with me. Thanks for having me, Isaac. Yeah, this is, this is going to be fun. So um, I, I know you dive deep into proposals and our audience at Civil Engineering Academy is uh, mainly civil engineers. And a lot of them are, are steeped into the engineering most likely, but I'm sure many people have been tapped to work on or write or help with proposals. So I thought it would be fun to have you come on and, and I can pick your brain about proposals and people that even own companies or presidents of companies, how we can do a better job of even winning our, on the proposals that they're producing. So uh, thanks for being here. Um, as we dive into this, I thought it'd be good uh, maybe for you to tell us a little bit about your background. Um, what, what's your background and how did we get to where we are right now? Okay, well, um, here, I'm gonna give you the short version. Uh, yeah. I've, I've certainly worked with a lot of civil engineers over the years, but I, I started off working with mechanical, electrical, and plumbing engineers hmm. for uh, an MEP design firm that was based out of New York City. And I worked a lot. I worked primarily with their lab design group, pharmaceutical lab design group, and their energy group. Then I, I moved on to construction consulting, a construction consulting firm. And we worked all over the country and, you know, on a lot of bridges and you name it type of projects. So I got a chance to submit proposals in nearly every state in, in places like Alaska, you know, Puerto Rico, uh, Hawaii, you know, all over the place, mostly uh, state agencies, federal agencies, but also some private clients as well. So why that's different is, is that most firms in our industry are very regional. Mm -hmm. right? and, the, and, the, and if you're working for a small civil engineering firm, you're probably submitting proposals on a regional basis. You know, a couple of local state or something. Right? Yeah. You're probably, if you're in New York, you're probably not submitting proposals in California or Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I got a chance to submit proposals all over the country. So and, and that gave me a lot of different experiences to understand how different agencies work and how the game works, if you will. That's the short version of it. Hey, I like it. So um, as a, as a, I guess your background is in engineering. Well, my background is, is public relations. So public I have, relations. A, yeah, I have a BA and BS. Gotcha. That's perfect. So what makes proposal development difficult, I guess, in, in your experiences? Well, any competitive situation is difficult, right? So it's like saying, well, what makes winning a basketball game difficult? That makes sense. Well, I'm from Philly. I'm from the Philly area. So if you have a point guard that refuses to shoot, 
you might have the best power forward in the game, but you're still going to be in in a tough situation because every element of that basketball team has to be working correctly to win the game. Right. I like, um, and yeah, there are, if you have Chamberlain, maybe he scores a hundred points and then you, (laughs) you win just like in a proposal, maybe your price is so low that, you know, it gives you an edge. Right. But if, if an element of your proposal isn't, isn't where it needs to be, you know, that, that, that can cause some difficulty in, in winning contracts. Makes sense. So at the end of the day, you know, proposed development is difficult, but it's difficult because every competitive situation is difficult. And typically when you submit a proposal, you're competing against other firms, whether you know it or not. And there's such a wide range too, of the scope of the project. Uh, you know, are, are you working on something that's smaller? Uh, is it is it a is it a huge project that's going to take a long time to develop the proposal? Um, I can think of other things too. Who are your teammate? You know, what kind of resumes can we put in here that make our proposal might stand out? Maybe that's a competitive edge that you have. Yeah, I mean, I've submitted proposals that were in multiple binders. Ooh, yeah. I know people who have submitted proposals that were delivered by helicopter. There was something. Are you serious? Serious. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, and I've also delivered proposals that were like three pages long. Well, never, never quite three pages, but, you know, less than 10, 10 pages long. Was the helicopter proposal the longest one you've ever worked on? Or? Well, I mean, I haven't personally worked on the helicopter. I'm, I'm more, I was more in the binder world. But, um, you know, that wasn't my proposal per se. That was just a mentor of mine. Gotcha. Well, uh, what are some keys to making uh, a proposal uh, competitive or making yourself, I don't know, stand out? What are some some takeaways or some things you've seen uh, on proposals that maybe make it rise to the top? Okay, well, um, I get involved. With, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly involved with the Construction Owners Association of America. Mm-hmm. Right? So I hang out sometimes with construction owners and by that i mean serial builders like a large university or a large healthcare system you know so when i'm talking about construction owners that's what i'm talking about and you know it's interesting to hear what they what they say when you're having a few drinks or or, or whatnot mm-hmm. or having a few pops as they say <laughs> one of the things a friend of mine says that he always says to consultants, designers, and engineers, and whatnot, is show me why you aren't a TV at Best Buy. Like when I'm going to Best Buy, I'm going to buy a TV. I'm looking for the largest TV at the lowest price. Mm. So why aren't you a TV at Best Buy? I like it. And so, and, and um, yeah, to kind of further, so sometimes firms will bring me in if there's a uh, proposal that they really feel like they need to win. You know, it's a big effort and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And if some there, there are some like key things that you can do um, that will help out that I find routinely helps out this effort. Mm-hmm. So, for example. I kind of have a proposal template that I use. Okay. And in my template, like when it has a resume, it's set up in a certain way, right? But it also says, why is Isaac perfect for this job? And it lists in bullet points why Isaac is perfect for this. Because when you're looking at proposals, you're probably looking at a resume for like five seconds. And in those five seconds, you have to create a narrative in the client's mind of who this person is. So I help, I use those bullet points to help create that narrative. And that's a lot, and that's something, for example, that not a lot of proposals do. Really? Yeah. So they aren't tailoring the resumes of the employees or those that they feel like are going to work on the job 
to, to the proposal itself? They do, but they yeah. don't, uh, they don't create a narrative like I'm talking about. They don't gotcha. use bullet points to highlight specific things that relate uh, to, they don't make it easy for someone to look at something in five seconds and say, oh, this is who this person is. This and this great. person is perfect for, for this job. That makes sense. Um, a lot of times firms don't really think about what games being played. That's a very, that's a big question I always ask. You know, what games being played here? Because you have to understand the game. You know, just like if you're playing basketball, you have to understand the rules of basketball if you want to win the basketball game. Right? Yes. And the rules for you know, the New York, uh, New York City DOT is different than the rules for the Texas DOT. That makes sense. It's completely different game. So you have to understand how how the game works. All right. So for let me give you kind of some extreme examples. Mm -hmm. So in Texas, typically firms team up to go after contracts. Right. Okay. So let's just say, and and the, the team that's submitting the the proposal is typically referred to as the prime, and everybody else is the sub consultant. This is typical terminology that your your audience is probably familiar with. What firms do in Texas is say, "Oh, it, you know, maybe with those three team members, we're actually going to submit three proposals, and in each of these proposals, um, there's you know the you know, it's going to be a different product. So firm A is going to be prime the first time, and then firm B is going to be subconsult. Well, the next proposal they submit, again, on the same contract, that firm uh, firm B is going to be the prime, and firm A is going to be a subconsult. Wow. Yeah, so that so you have to understand the game that's being played, and the, the, they do that for a specific reason because – Texas, for example, doesn't really score you on your resumes. It's really a pass-fail type of thing. And what they really score you on is a series of questions you ask. They mm. ask you these like four or five questions. You have to, for the short story is you, ha you have to answer those questions. And depending on how you answer those questions is how you score, right? So it's better to have three chances than it is to have one chance, mm -hmm. right? That so that's sense. a very extreme example of how the you know how is this game being played. It'd be interesting to see, and I don't know how, but all these companies, I, I guess, in this example, they're all talking with each other on 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 this type of proposal. So I I like the this game. They they get a chance no matter how it gets worked out, whether you're the prime or not prime. Um, but that that's an interesting set of rules that the they follow, and I wonder if that was just something they um, figured out over time, or if that's the way it's always been that they have teamed up like that. Well, firms are firms are often clever, and they they figure out how to how to play the game that's that's set, that's set forth. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, here's another extreme. I'm giving you extreme examples. Okay. Um, here's a better, this is a better extreme example. Some agencies have a written document that says, here's, here's what we want to see in this proposal. All right. Here's before they even score the proposal, they've identified what they want to see the answers to the questions, what they think the answers are. Right. And they'll have, let's just say a procurement manager, evaluate how close is this firm's answer to 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 my sheet hmm. right so if you're playing that game and you're answering a question well you better know how hot they like their tea hmm. you know how hot does this firm like their tea you need to know how they see the world and parrot back what they think the answer is and to do that you kind of have to know what that answer is. And it sure helps if you have somebody at your firm that maybe recently left that agency. Mm -hmm. Right. So again, 
it's it's really a big game and you have to know what game you're playing makes sense i hope that answers i mean of course the pricing has to be right you have to have the right people you know if you're submitting on a big civil engineering contract your project manager can't his last job shouldn't have been a circus clown (laughs) you know maybe they should have a p after their name because because one of the things to go on a tangent here and this is going to you know speak to you i think it's very difficult to especially when you get to the you know a dot contract where you're going jacobs is submitting a com submitting http submitting all these other firms are submitting these big civil engineering firms it's hard to distinguish one from the other. Yeah. And sometimes people might say, who's got more PEs here? They might just look at the, the this define some value in the initials after someone's name. Yeah, I can see that. And, and that's I agree. <laughs> why. Go, get, go get your PE if you don't yeah. got it. Yeah, well, that's one reason. Another reason is PE. You know, you know what that stands for, right? Um, well, I believe it stands for professional engineer. But do you have another? It stands for pay extra. Oh, I like it. So that's another good reason to get your PE. But uh, (laughs) I've all, you know, sometimes I was in a situation where there would be a twenty-year veteran Mm -hmm. resume. And they would be like, oh, I want EIT on my resume. And I would say, I'm never submitting your resume saying EIT on it. Because I don't want to submit a 20-year veteran that's an engineering training. Right. You know, I want to submit someone with a PE. That makes sense. Right. Obviously, you have to get EIT for your PE, but uh, but that was kind of a rabbit hole. Man. <laughs> that was good. I like it. Um are there other common mistakes that you see in developing proposals that maybe you have observed that that we could call out that people could improve on? Yeah, um, there's there's a ton. I bet there's a bunch, but well, I mean, at, at kind of a high level, what do you see are kind of the, cringeworthy? The one I'm most known for talking about is, is what's known as the peanut butter and jelly problem. Okay. So here's the peanut butter and jelly problem. Typically, uh, in an RFP or request for proposal, they'll say, here's the scope of work, and, and please describe your approach and methodology to this scope of work. Right? Mm-hmm. So let's say the scope of work was, Matt wants a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Describe your approach to providing Matt with a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Most firms will write this. We will make you a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And they'll follow it by saying, trust us, it'll be great. And that's completely insane because that approach completely lacks an approach. And and people get confused or, or maybe there's not enough education about what is a scope of work versus what an approach is. Right. You know, the scope of work is making a peanut, you know, making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. But how are you going to make that peanut butter and jelly sandwich? And why are you going to make it that way? Well, so that's, missed, that's missed probably the, the most famous, you know. That's a good one. Uh, I can see, you know, I could definitely see that out there where people aren't very descriptive in developing how they're going to do that. Um, I imagine if you see that, that, that is a little cringeworthy. Yeah, people send me proposals to critique all the time, and and I have I have like five of them right now waiting to get done, and that is probably the most common issue that I see. Why Why is that? Is it because our engineers not great writers? Is it because we are um, simply trying to get it done quickly, and they just do that that way? Why do you think that is? Combination. I think it's the lack of, of. I think it probably comes down to a lack of training. Mm. It's that, and that's a great question. It's a little bit different than than an, another issue 
that's more of a compliance issue that comes across. So, and let me go down another tangent. So another issue, and I wanted to demonstrate like how these issues are a little bit different. Why I think that one's more of a, like a training yes, issue. Yeah. Okay. You know? And you've worked on proposals. You probably never had any real training about how to write a technical approach. Yeah, I have um, written proposals, um, quite a few of them, and there isn't a real good, I mean, no one's given me a textbook on how to write a proposal. You're pulling from your own expertise, your own experience, and uh, oftentimes companies are relying on you to spell that out on this, you know, how are we going to do this? And let's piece it together. Yeah, but nobody so, told you about the peanut butter and jelly mistake. Say, hey, don't oh, make the no. peanut butter and jelly mistake. No, I so, this, so I think that's like a lack of training. Yes, thing. there's that, another. No one's uh, pointed that out. No. Yeah. So there's another issue. It's more of a compliance related issue where, at the core of proposals, the client asks you a question and you answer. It, right. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times people don't want to answer the questions. Hmm. They like refuse to answer the question. So here's a classic one you see for, you know. Uh, construction job they'll say something like you know sometimes there are disputes between designers and contractors and subcontractors so what systems do you have in place to avoid or eliminate these disputes right and here's what the contractor will say the contractor will always say this well we've worked with every design firm and every sub, every subcontractor out there in our you know in our area We've never had a problem. And in fact, the principles of these firms are the godparents of my children. So every Sunday they come to my house and we, we sit around the campfire and we sing Kumbaya. <laughs> really? And yeah, that's that's how they answer the question, but that oh. doesn't answer the question. The question is what systems do you have in place? And they never ever talk anything about systems. And we get a family get together over dinner. <laughs> yeah. And like it answering like that is like one, they don't want to answer the question hmm. because they know, Oh, they've been on a construction site before. They know when there's RFIs flying around, sometimes things get a little heated. Uh, and as, as someone I know on the owner's side always says, why am I the ref? Why am I the referee? Hmm. Why do I have to come? to work every day. I hired this designer to design me a building. I hired this contractor to build it. Why do I have to come work to come to work and be the referee? That's right. I like that. And the thing is your clients aren't stupid. So answering a question like that, you're, you're not answering because you don't want to answer. It. It's a tough question. Mm -hmm. okay? That's different than the peanut butter and jelly problem. Where it's just the peanut butter and jelly problem is more of a, an education problem. In my opinion. That makes sense. Um, those are some good uh, issues to point out. I'm sure there are many, many more that there you've are. got on the top of your head. Um, I'm curious, um, you know, many engineers, I, you know, a lot of our audience are engineers just starting out and maybe they haven't had a chance to work on a proposal. And some of them don't understand how that process might work. Uh, and, and they don't understand maybe um, how costs are associated with develop, be, developing a proposal or even how they might be recuperated in, in that proposal if you are awarded the project. Could you briefly talk about, for those that maybe don't understand this, um, costs associated with developing the proposal and how any of that might be recuperated? Sure, and this kind of this gets a little bit into accounting, nah. <laughs> I would say. But um, well, we don't need I you to do that. It. But you I know, so, high level. So all the costs associated with putting proposals together are known as allowable indirect costs. So even in the federal realm, you know, where costs recoup the costs in in the overhead portion of your rates. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, if you spend a ton of money in proposals and lose them, well, it's going to be hard to raise your rates to account for that. Unless you're strictly on a, like, uh, a, it's called a cost plus scenario, which many of the large civil engineering contracts sometimes work in this 
uh, you know, ASHTO cost plus scenario where every year you, you provide a, an audit of your overhead, right? And you get paid based on that audit to some respect. Hmm. You know, as a mentor of mine once said, if, if you want to spend less money on proposals, ultimately you got to win more and you got to lose less. There you go. I like it. <laughs> so, yeah, you're, you know, proposal costs are recruited differently, a little bit differently than, let's just say, doing a podcast or, or sending flyers out or doing online advertisements. You know, those are disallowable indirect costs. So you really can't put them into your audited overhead that as costs sense. that can be recouped. So in general though, you're working on proposal if you're working on proposals, your time is spent on overhead for for the company. Um you're not yeah. actively like billing a project. It's going to overhead costs. Yeah. That hopefully, maybe if you get awarded the project, you can get recuperated on, get some some of that back. Well, so you should be recording All right. hours towards the proposal. Ah, uh, yes. So yes. if you're working on a proposal, you should be recording, you know, every proposal should really have a number, mm -hmm. a charge number to it. And you should be billing to that number. I like it. Right? Uh, again, this is kind of accounting, but that's different than if you took a client out to lunch. Right? Let's say you spend your time, you know, talk, taking your client out to lunch. Um, you would bill your time differently. Yep. But let's just say, <laughs> again, I'm getting into accounting. Let's just say you went to a client's office to talk about a specific project they're putting out in the street, you would record that differently as well. I like it. So that again, it goes kind of more into your accounting system. If you're just, if you just have like marketing costs or overhead, if you, if, if your accounting system has billable work and overhead, and those are the only two, um, categories you have that's probably problematic gotcha well i know at least in some companies they have teams that develop proposals and so a lot of times those employees are billing their time to those proposal numbers but the, those end up all you know being overhead costs not necessarily uh built to like a, a capital project yet but um in any case we could it sounds like we could definitely go down a rabbit hole with accounting numbers, but yeah. you will have a number to charge to for your proposal you're working on. So you should, yeah, you should. Um, Matt, what for you excites you about working on proposals, and how can engineers get involved with making you know working on those or have the opportunity to do them? Well, it's a little bit two different questions. Um, so, what excites me about proposals is by nature, I'm extremely competitive. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if I'm going, you want to win this. into a tough situation where, like, I'm going, you know, I used to go up against the biggest of the big, you know, and I was working for a very small firm. You know, I want to beat those guys. Mm -hmm. You know, I one of the, some of the biggest, most proudest moments of my life is that we submit a proposal, we win. You know, we're in Philadelphia, we submit a proposal in. You know, Wyoming, we win. And then the local engineer, civil engineering firms, like, what the heck's going on here? So they submit bid protests saying, hey, no way these guys could have won. And of course, they lose those protests because we were <laughs> clearly the best choice based on our proposal. Um, so that excites me. That's great. <laughs> yeah. As far as how engineers can be given the opportunity to work on proposals, ultimately, as they move up the ladder, they'll have to, right? Ultimately, if you, you're not going to be the senior vice president unless you brought in some work or at least helped brought in some work, right? So yep. there's going to be a point in time. And, and, and I like to talk about this a lot. 
because I think it's something that we don't really don't really realize mm -hmm. is that you go to engineering school, you get your engineering degree. Hopefully, you took your P your EIT test or your FE test right after you went to school. Yeah, or get during it, right. <laughs> get it uh, but <laughs> I digress. So you, you uh, start working for a firm, civil engineering firm, and ultimately, maybe a couple years later, someone puts an RP in your desk and says, "Hey, go write us a document that wins us this you know million dollar, or ten million dollar, or billion dollar contract." Mm -hmm. right? And you're like, well, where was this? I took the PE test. There was no section of this in the PE test or in this civil engineering. Where was where was this? Right. <laughs> and that's kind of where you're left. And think about how unique that is to our industry. Right. If you were a school teacher, no one would you know, give you a guitar and say, hey, listen, uh, go up on the stage and play a Jimi Hendrix song for us. You know, that yeah. just wouldn't happen. Right. But yet engineers kind of get that same exact scenario. Where they're saying, hey, do this writing thing, this persuasive sales writing thing that you had no education on. And this is super important for our business. Right. That's that's kind of unique to our industry. and. and I don't think people appreciate that enough, how unique it is and how, how we put engineers into that situation. But if I was an engineer and I wanted to, you know, grow my uh, or, you know, further my career, again, first I would get the pay extra designation. <laughs> but ultimately, I would try to get good at winning business. And part of that is being good at, you know, talking to clients and understanding clients' needs and helping clients out. But another part of that is, is writing proposals, you know, helping help, you know, learning how to articulate what it is, you know, onto a piece of piece of paper while thinking about the client's needs and the client's challenges. I think those are great answers. I think uh, there's opportunities for engineers to to get into that realm. I think you're like you said, you'll naturally get pulled into that um, the longer you're in your industry and as you move up the ladder. I've been pulled into working on proposals for a lot of different projects. Um, have been fortunate to win some too, and that's exciting when you bring in work that way and uh, hopefully get a little extra kudo and pat on the back for it. Uh, as you get to design it too. <laughs> so, um, where um, can others get more education about this or learn more about it? Is there any resources that you might point to for our audience? Yeah, I have some good resources. So, one of them is, is my website. It's called helpeverybodyeveryday.com. I know that's a weird sounding website for what it is I do. But it makes sense that as, as you read it. So if you go to helpeverybodyeveryday.com, there's going to be a couple of different places where you can enter your name and your email address. And that's going to start you off with a um, five-part proposal writing crash course. That's thousands of people have gone through that and, and they found it very helpful. But if you want to read a book, uh, my favorite book, here's my favorite book on proposal writing. Hmm. The Magic of Winning Proposals. By one of my mentors, Laura Ricci, actually wrote the foreword for this book because it's my absolute favorite book about great. writing proposals. So this is this is available wherever fine books are sold. Uh, you know, you can buy it off on Amazon. Perfect. So again, the magic of winning of the magic of winning proposals. That's a good one. It's, and it's an easy, it's I like this book. It's a bit. I like it because it's it's written by a human <laughs> and you can get these other like books uh, proposals there's there's plenty of them out there some of them like are literally like a dictionary they're um, written like a dictionary yeah that's and dry. that's that's not fun to read this is this is a proposal book that you could actually read you could actually be comfortable reading i love it well, we'll link that in the show notes as well. I think that's a great resource. Definitely go check out your website too. You've got good stuff there. Um, and this has been fun. Um, thanks for joining us. Thanks for talking about proposals. Many people probably 
uh, has probably never crossed their mind about proposals. Maybe it has, maybe they're in them, but uh, I think you've shared some things that have been enlightening for us. So thanks for jumping on with me, Matt. What's the best way for our audience to connect with you? Well, um, going to my website's one way, you know, there's a, there's a contact for, from there, but you can always email me at matt at help everybody every day.com. Um, you know, people email me all the time and, you know, I'm happy to just, uh, I respond to every email. Well, you know, hopefully we whack, can get some proposals sent your way. <laughs> I, yeah. I respond to every email that's sent my, sent my way. At least I, at the very least I, I read it and if there's something to respond to, I'll respond to it. Excellent. Well, thanks for doing this with me, Matt. Appreciate it. And definitely learned a lot. Thanks, Isaac. I enjoyed it. All right. See ya. See ya.